Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to episode seven of Level Up, our weekly Q&A show where your questions drive our conversation. If you're watching on LinkedIn or YouTube and would like to join in the conversation, please follow the links in the chat to register and we'll send you over to Slido. Slido is where you get to join in and really drive the show by adding in your questions or voting up the questions that you want answered. Without your questions, we don't really have anything to talk about. So we'll just end up talking amongst ourselves. So head over there and it'll be great to see you. The first half of our show is general Q&A. This week's theme is public-private partnerships. So you can ask pretty much anything relating to that. In the second half, we choose a topic we want to spend a little more time on and a bit more about that later. So let's meet our panel for today. Okay, we will start over in uh, Nigeria. Um, Nyananso, um, who, uh, Nyananso is a managing consultant at Weir Capacity. Uh, Nyananso, welcome and please introduce yourself. Hello everyone, um, it is good to be here and I look forward to a wonderful discussion with everybody. I'm in Abuja in Nigeria and it's a sunny day here and uh, I hope that we can have a very interesting discussion with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. A little later, Nian Anso is going to be leading today's focus topic, talking to us about winning teams, how to find them, build them and support them, uh, a key enabler for any PPP project. So moving over to Canada, I'd like to welcome Armin Kewa, who's the Chief Training Officer at Taraza, specializing in PP education. Hi, Armin. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Amen. I'm from. Uh, I'm based in Canada. Uh, specialized in uh, P3, as you said. Uh, I'm originally from Jordan, so I have experience in several countries. So I'm looking forward to uh, today's uh, sessions. Thank you. Thank you. So over to India now, and joining us is Amandeep Singh, who is an international PPP transaction advisor and is working with the World Bank. Uh, welcome, Amandeep. Thank you, Ali. Hi, everyone. Good to be here and uh, hope uh, I'm currently in India working with the World Bank as a consultant and uh, working across sectors and different geographies. So love to be in, you know, here and uh, good, good to have a good discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we have two panelists actually joining us from here in the UK. Um, firstly, uh, Mark Williams. Mark is a public service advisor from Grant Thornton working on PPP and PFI efficiencies. Hello, Mark. Hi there, so Mark Williams from Grant Thornton, uh, involved in uh, looking at some of the 700 PFIs we've got in the UK, many of which are approaching expiry and seeing what they look like at the, uh, at the upper end. Um, 25 years plus experience of PPPs and PFIs, um, also lots of experience around training, including through SIPFA, uh, Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy, both of the World Bank CP3P uh, course, but also of Treasury's business case course. Lovely. Thanks, Mark. Also in the UK is Maurice Diamond. Maurice is a coach and tutor on the CP3P professional qualifications. Welcome, Maurice. Um, so, hello. Um, I work with uh, training Bite Size and also Terraza uh, internationally to deliver PPP training courses typically those accredited by APMG. Um, I have been involved in PPP since its inception as the PFI in the United Kingdom, and then globally uh, from the uh, early uh, 2000s, uh, delivering training and advice uh, across uh, Africa, Asia and the Americas. Lovely to have you with us, Maurice. Thank you. Now, if you folks at home are thinking that you could answer some of these questions or perhaps around your particular area of expertise and you'd like to join us on the panel, just let us know and one of the team will tell you how. So without further ado, let's jump into the first question and hear from our question master for today, um, Chachitra, who's joining us from Bangalore in India. Hi, Chachitra. Hello, everyone. We have a question from Chukwadi Anonopu. Which is more important, the structure of the PPP or the realistic viability of the project? Okay, panel, who wants to give me some uh, okay opinions on that one? Great. Well, we'll go for Maurice first and then we'll move to Armin. Okay, so this is, um, uh, as they all will be, a, a very good question. And why do I say that? Because 
people all argue about structure and viability, at the end of the day, all projects have to be viable. And the structure is one part of that viability. Um, and that's what uh, people forget. And it's really important to understand the connection between those two. I'm sure that others will want to add to that. Armin, we'll come to you next and then we'll hear from Armandeep. Uh, well, I would just to follow that up that uh, any project has to be viable to start with. So it's so, supposed to be a sort of a complementary relationship. So both of them are just as important as uh, uh, for a project to go through. But you need to, the project to have its own viability, both from the economic side and from the ability to uh, provide service to the public before you even go into the PP area. So it's yes, it's, it's a, an entangled uh, relationship. Thank you so much. Armandeep, you had some thoughts on this one. Yeah, I agree with my colleagues that it's it's both go hand in hand. Uh, once the project needs to be viable from all aspects, whether it's technical, environmental, social, ESG, you know, financial, commercial aspects, only then you think of structuring. So while structuring, you look at a different structure of the project, whether it's availability payment, user pay, revenue raise, et cetera, et cetera. At the end, it has to be viable again. It has to be viable and bankable. So both go hand in hand. Thanks so much. Great information. Okay. Um, so Chicha then, what is question number two? Uh, we have a question from Romeda in Florence in Italy. We submitted a business case to our development bank for a PPP, but it was rejected because we didn't show return on investment. Where can I find out more about building a better business case? Okay, Mark, great. We'll come to you for that one first. So that sounds we'll like one. Answer. Sounds like one for me. In that, as I said in the introduction, I also train uh, UK HM Treasury's Better Business Case course, which again is an APM G uh, product, and um, yeah, about ten thousand people worldwide have been through that training course. And there's a huge amount of material on the uh, HM Treasury website about how to develop. Uh, business cases, um, and that covers across um, the strategic context, the options in the economic case. It talks about the commercial arrangements we're going to put in place, in this case uh, for a PPP, uh, the financial case in terms of the return on investment, um, but then also the management case, which links into the comments earlier on viability, the ability to actually deliver something. So I think uh, often, you know, the PPP training goes hand in hand with the business case training because again, you can develop the best theoretical PPP in the world, but if you can't actually get it through uh, approvals and you can't actually deliver it, um, it doesn't have the, uh, the value. So I'd point to the better business case training. Great. Thank you, Mark. Did any of the rest of the panel want to comment on this one? Um, or should we? Okay. Maurice, we'll have, uh, we'll have you then Leon and so thanks. Okay, um, so just to uh, reinforce what Mark mentioned, um, the material is available on the internet and it uh, is one of the things which the New Zealand government has adopted. So you might find that some of the documentation is actually badged as being New Zealand and it's the international business case, but it's still the same as the better business case material uh, produced by APMG. And I always recommend that uh, people uh, use that material um, to do effective business cases. Great, thank you very much for that. Nian Anso, your thoughts, please. Yes, um, I mean, it's, the question says we did not um, show return on investment. I think business case basically means a case for business. So if there's no return on investment, uh, that means there's no case for business. So. Um, where can you find, you know, you know, um, sources of building your, your your knowledge on building better business case? Yes, the APMG has provided that, but please don't forget to get advisors because um, if it's a public authority that is asking the question, you need advisors to help you do this because you can read, you know, you know about business cases, but with an advisor, you can do a better job of preparing something that would get an approval. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's great advice. There was lots of nodding going along on the panel um, there with you, Nia Nanso. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next question then, Suchitra. The next question is from Nofi Barnabas Johanna. How do we maintain the principle of transparency in USPs without a Swiss challenge? Okay, Nia Nanso, it's back to you again for this one. So I have a feeling that question is from Nigeria because um, we use those terminologies a lot, USP and Swiss challenge. So USP basically means unsolicited proposals um, and Swiss challenge is the method the, the federal uh, regulatory authority uses in Nigeria to make sure that unsolicited proposals are transparent. You know. uh, but the truth be told, um, unsolicited proposals should not be the, the normal thing. It should be an exception. So if you have a very good plan and um, and uh, and you put these plans identifying what should go for PPPs, then also said proposal should basically be for what you, should, you did not capture. But unfortunately, what we have presently is that a lot of projects are going for also said proposals. So what I would suggest in terms of transparency is that from onset, early on, let everybody know. When I mean everybody, advertise it that you have received an unsolicited proposal and you've accepted or rejected because it's part of your plan or it's not part of your plan, then the process to which you're going to procure that partner to become um, your, your approved or preferred bidder should be made very, very clear. The switch challenge is there in Nigeria to show that process. However, I say without a switch challenge, I would say advertise early on so, so everybody knows what you're doing. That's great. Thanks so much for that information. Did any of the panel, uh, Armandeep, would like to add further to this question? Yeah, so it's very difficult to have a transparency, especially without Swiss challenge. Swiss challenge is basically the reverse bidding process, right? You get the USP and then you run it the uh, market with after accepting the proposal. But without Swiss challenge, def it is difficult if the regulatory mechanism or the framework doesn't have the things in place, the very objective outcome of a unsolicited proposal. So the first thing first need to done to fix the regulatory have a proper guidelines, objective outcomes, and the process of accepting at each phase of the uh, unsolicited proposal. But still, uh, if 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 a country is uh, building a regulation or or amending it, so please do have a Swiss challenge or the reverse bidding to have a more transparency. Okay, thank you. We'll just hear from Maurice on this one then, and we'll move on to the next question. Yes, I, I'd just like to remind everybody that there's more than one mechanism to deal with unsolicited bids. Uh, 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 along with the Swiss challenge, there are at least three others that are mentioned uh, within the CP3P qualification. Um, one of my concerns with the Swiss challenge, if I could just quickly mention it, is that the Swiss challenge gives the unsolicited uh, uh, bidder the opportunity to match uh, the best price after the competition has been run. Uh, the reality is that most big companies will not participate in a Swiss challenge because they anticipate that they will put in maybe two, maybe three, maybe $10 million worth of effort. And then at the end of it, the person that put the unsolicited bid in the first place will be allowed to match that price. And consequently, uh, all of that work will have been nugatory. So uh, in order to be transparent and to show that there's fairness is, a, is quite a difficult job. But there are other methods that are stated, and APMGs do state them, uh, other than the Swiss challenge. Thank you, Maurice. That was a really great input. OK, um, so Chicha, what do we have for our next question? We've had, we had a question that just come in from Omar Hadjel. What activities can we undertake to forge stronger partnerships between the private and public sectors to drive greater social value in the communities? Okay, who wants to answer this one for me then? I believe that Omar is watching us live now, so let's give him some, some feedback. We'll go to Armin and then to Mark. Well, yeah, this is a very wide uh, question that can cover a lot of points. 
but when you think of, uh, you have to have knowledge, I suppose is the first base to have uh, knowledge on both parties, the private sector and the public sector, because you need to establish some sort of trust, some sort of uh, uh, acceptance of each other's uh, ability to participate in a project. This is something that the evolved world, like a place like Canada, where uh, 30 years of PPPs have developed a sort of a partnership, a knowledge, a uh, pre preemption of projects. Uh, the other issue is sometimes the things like sounding, project sounding always helps in, in getting a stronger partnership between the two parties. Uh, and uh, open and transparent uh, knowledge base uh, between the two parties and where the projects are going and uh, engagement of the stakeholders. So all of these will help in uh, driving the greater social value uh, with, with the communities around them. Thanks. Thank you, Armin. Um, Mark. So agree, yeah, it's around uh, openness and transparency. Um, it's important, I believe, for the private sector to understand how public sector actors measure social value, uh, socioeconomic value. So it's useful if the uh, private sector uh, have a, an understanding, again, of that business case approach as to how these things are measured. Um, lots of work's gone on in the UK around this. You know, clearly, we're quite a, a mature market in these uh, areas and, um, you know, there's now mandatory requirements for the private sector in uh, in bidding to say what they're doing around social value, both through the projects, but also more broadly in their business. They'd be expected to be saying something about the social value in their business. Also, you know, now they need to be talking about, you know, their ambitions to reach uh, uh, net zero around uh, carbon emissions in their bids uh, as well. Then we also have lots of literature here around, you know, the types of partnership arrangements you need in place, depending upon the complexity and the length of the uh, services that the public sector are looking to buy. So clearly, if they're buying sort of, you know, goods and services, uh, you know, stationary, you don't need a, a partnership arrangement. However, as you go up that sort of complexity curve, um, you need different forms of uh, contract structure, different forms of partnerships different forms of behavior. You can't be running a 25 year PFI, arguably with a confrontational uh, partnership relationship. Uh, so there's tools and techniques that have been uh, developed here and are used here quite extensively in terms of how do we assess that partnership working uh, across the, the 25 years, you know, how do we maybe improve it? And that's proven very valuable as well as we get to the end of some of these 25 year contracts. Um, I didn't necessarily ever envisage, you know, that I'd be around when uh, some of the contracts I was involved in putting together originally came to an end and I'm not sure anybody did, but we're now seeing them and that, that partnership working and that social value across the lifetime of the contracts is, is very important. Thank you, Mark. Um, Omar, we hope that that answered your question. And uh, Sue Teacher, can we have the next one, please? The next question is from Okitani in Lagos, Nigeria. What is the best framework to use for our PPP? We have failed in the past due to many misunderstandings between us and the private sector contractors. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, panel, which one of you wants to go first on this one? Okay, Mark and then Nia Nanso, please. So obviously going to start with the, the pitch that says using CP3P and also the business case uh, approach, you know, by far the best framework. But, you know, having been involved in the outset of why were we developing CP3P, you know, there is a logic that says um, if the private sector partner has a level of understanding at this level, we need to build the public sector capacity. Otherwise, um, there'll be an asymmetry of knowledge, so we do need that uh, understanding. Then, in some ways, it's about sort of breaking it down, to my mind, because, you know, yes, PPPs are complicated, um, but you can make them a whole lot more complicated if you choose. It's much better, I think, to sort of break it down. And the guide's great in terms of saying, look, this is about design, build, finance, operate, maintain. 
how you combine those things together, how you do the risk sharing, how you potentially uh, get the benefits of the private sector integrating these arrangements, the due diligence that will be done by the private sector, and how that potentially is a better approach than buying those services individually as towers on short-term contracts. So yeah, you can make PPPs as you know, really complicated, but actually I like trying to break it down and highlight that most things in public services have been done before. And there is a sort of parallel. And, um, you know, if you look at the towers of individual contracts, this is just a better model to follow. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so we'll go to Nia Nanso and then Armandeep. Um, we'll hear from you after that. OK. OK, I think this question links directly with the previous you just immediate past question about um, partnership. You know, because what, what really failed, you know, uh, framework is one thing, uh, but what really got you to fail is another thing. So I think first is to identify the, um, the, the, the area of failure, what, what failed. Was it because of there was no transparency or there was no respect for the partner? Uh, so what I would say is, you know, building strong partnerships so you don't have misunderstandings. In terms of framework, yes, you know, just like Mark, Mark mentioned, uh, the, the PP guide that has you know, you know, laid out the processes on what you need to have at minimum. However, in terms of failure and misunderstanding, it has to be about building your partnership, having you know, proper equity, mutual benefits, and also ensuring that there's transparency on both sides. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Armandy. Yeah, so you know, the question is the best framework. Framework one, it, it, what, what is the frame? Framework is all the procedures, processes, and the decision-making decision process at each phase of the PPP life cycle, right? Right from the selection of the project till its uh, hand handback. Uh, but those frameworks are prepared based on the existing legislative and administrative setup in a particular country. Now, if we have that, we need, we want to amend it. That is a longer way. But going away where the PPP or uh, private sector is getting misunderstandings are happening is because of the poor structure also. If the structure and the contract agreement is not clear on each and every event of the PPP life cycle, private sub sector is always smart. They will take you for right. So the structure and the contract itself has to be very, very clear. No ambiguity at all. Thank you, Armandeep. We'll just, uh, Maurice has just put his hand up, so we'll just hear um, his thoughts on this and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, so one of my uh, concerns is, um, as I've worked in different countries, is that frameworks don't necessarily work in those countries. And when I've looked at those frameworks, it's because they've been adopted lock, stock and barrel from another country with a different uh, constitutional or uh, legislative background. Um, also, I've seen um, frameworks that were for roads and user pays projects being taken and adopted again, lock, stock and barrel for buildings. And this demonstrates a lack of understanding and knowledge by the PPP unit. Um, and the private sector immediately lose confidence um in the public sector when they see this happening not only do they lose confidence but they realize that they probably have more knowledge experience and understanding and therefore can take advantage of the uh private uh, sorry of the public sector um and it so it can lead to problems so a good framework has to be developed um locally um yes it can draw upon precedents from elsewhere and, but we need to engage with the private sector. They need to have confidence and we have to build skills in both parties. And Mark and uh, uh, Armin Deep and so on have, have, have made comments on that. So I won't go back over those. But the critical thing is make sure that your framework is appropriate for the, your own environment. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, so to Chitra, what is our next question for the panel? We have a question from Ron and Sari in the UK. I am involved in multiple PPPs and we constantly have disputes. Is there an effective way of dealing with these disputes? 
Right then, panel, effective ways of dealing with disputes. Who wants to go first on this one? <laughs> okay, Armin, we haven't heard from you for a little while, and then we'll go to Armin Deep and then Nian Anso for this one. I'm going to sort of start a bit with a cheeky answer and then say no, <laughs> because uh, when you think of uh, disputes, uh, it, it's about so, uh, many of the disputes have their root in the contract themselves and the contract itself and uh, some of the issues that were not sort of addressed early on. But but uh, to be more serious, uh, it's, it's continuous monitoring, uh, open negotiations. We have seen in recent uh, in the last couple of years due to COVID. Uh, some sort of un, uh, uh, unforeseen disputes because uh, suddenly you, you have uh, projects like airports and highways suddenly not having the basic uh, volumes that uh, were uh, important to the project. So that created some disputes, but it also opened up the idea of negotiations or uh, coordination between the public party and the private party. There should be a sort of a joint uh, team or a continuous uh, monitoring of experts from the public sector over the private sector and a, co a, a continuous uh, a open channel. So whenever there is, when there is no problem, the channel should be open. There should be continuous reporting, continuous uh, monitoring, and that what would uh, help uh, disputes being resolved. Because specifically, one, if once, one specific way uh, of uh, getting disputes resolved does not exist. It's a multiple of ways to have uh, disputes resolved because I've seen it in many in many countries where uh, disputes went to court while others just simply were resolved immediately. Thank you. Right, Armand Deep. I'll split this into two parts. You know, the disputes are one of the disputes, as Amin said, unforeseenable. For example, COVID thing, right? The many of the disputes are being created uh, from telling from experience are being created everyone knows right from the contract manager to the private sector they know this dispute is going to happen so it's basically boils down to effective contract management if a thought i uh, know so because right now at this stage contract is already signed i can't say or you can't say that make the contract better so it has been structured it has been drafted everything now things boils down to a contract manage, management. So if authority have a better contract management, foresee what event is going to come and manage it there and then, the so disputes can be, number of disputes will come down. And uh, secondly, yes, if it is unforeseen, then the parties together, there are many ways, as Amin said, that that should happen. So look at the two different uh, points. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Nia Nanso, your thoughts on this one, please. Um, I, I think I would just say the best way to, to um, effectively deal with disputes is to prevent them. Just try to prevent those disputes, but also prepare for them. Preparing for them means you've got a mechanism on, on how to manage disputes. So a dispute mechanism you know, framework has to be part of your contract. That way, when they occur, for instance, the unforeseen, uh, then you know how to manage them easily. But for this, the ones you can see, prevent them, make sure they don't happen. Excellent, thank you. All right, Suchitra, our next question, please. Uh, we've had another question that just come in from Michael Kahinde. What has been the experience of how endemic corruption impacts on effective project delivery and benefits realization? I think we might have the wrong question on the screen, Suchitra. Could you just repeat that one for the panel? Sorry about go. that. Uh, this question is, what has been the experience of how endemic corruption impacts on effective project delivery and benefits realization? Okay, panel, who am I coming to first for this one then? <laughs> Maurice, thank you. And then Nian Anso. Okay, um, so I'm going to be quite controversial. Um, when we read about PPP, one of the things it uh, talks about is transparency, good competition, and so on, because um, there are various tools associated with PPP that can drive that behavior. The reality is that a country has to be ready to behave in that particular way, that ethical way, 
that competitive way and that transparent way. If the country is not ready or the country has different cultural values, doing a PPP will not change the way that individuals work. And I must give you a very quick anecdote. I was working on a project in a particular country and the United States government asked me to, to provide oversight. And on one occasion, they said, can you go and help to negotiate the price? So the price is based on a financial model and we need to see what the uh, returns are going to be and so on. But when I arrived, they introduced me and they said, this is Morris Diamond. He's going to help to negotiate on price. And the bidder said, unfortunately, Mr. Diamond, you've wasted your time. We don't do business like this in this country. And I spoke with my brother, the permanent secretary last week, and we have already agreed the price. So I recommend that you go back to your hotel and sit by the swimming pool, which is what I did. I did, of course, back to report back to my uh, sponsor and as, uh, they were happy that I'd reported back the, the risks associated with that. Um, but quite frankly, I think that we have to recognize that PPP itself is not going to deal with endemic corruption unless some of my colleagues here have a different view. I think we'll just we'll just hear from uh, uh, Nia Nanso and then Armandeep on this particular question, and then we're going to uh, move into our focus topic. Um, thank you. I think um, corruption has major, very, I mean, huge impact on, on project delivery and the benefits because um, uh, people don't get the benefits of this project. Uh, for instance, PPPs have you know been given a bad name. Uh, because of the word corruption and people don't get the value of PPPs as they should. And so, you know, to prevent uh, you know, corruption, uh, it has to be an institutional thing. So it's not a one-off activity or it's not what you put in a contract. It's something that institutions have to take a decision saying we have to go the right path. And then you start putting in place the mechanisms to prevent, you know, corrupt activities. Because whether you like it or not, across the chain of PPP from identification of project to, to contract you know, management, there will be you know, you know, challenges in terms of corruption. However, if you put in place a mechanism to identify and nip, nip the corrupt, corrupt activities in the board early on, then you can have a successful PPP that will deliver value to the user public. Thank you. Thank you, Nia Nanso. Okay, so Armandeep, your final thoughts on this one, and then we will move on. Thank you. Yeah, so it's you know, always a tricky question. So, so I agree with my colleagues that this is, you know, depends upon the attitude of a particular country or region. Really, uh, region. But at the same time, I just wanted to request all my, you know, colleagues and fraternity in the PPP, PPP fraternity, that we are currently discussing ESG, ESG financing everywhere. You know, E and S has been been taken care of since long but the, this is a g part the governance part is being forget forgotten by everyone everyone means everyone we always focus on es e and s environment and social aspects fine but g aspect is always being forgotten so need to stress as a you know collectively approach so if we stress on the g the governance of the ppps governance of the process and then take on over make a mechanism Slowly, I, I think we will evolve and have a better world. Thank you, Armandeep. Um, okay, so thanks everybody. Great questions and really great advice. Um, it's time to change gear now to our focus topic. So for those of you uh, watching live in Slido, um, just click on the focus topic tab and enter your questions there for this section. Um, today, our topic is all about winning teams. Uh, some of us have been very lucky to join a team that becomes amazing at what they do. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Nia Nanso to share his thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think the questions we've had before now, you know, will, will come into this very, very, very effectively because uh, what we're presenting is about winning teams and in the context of PPPs, but also in the context of a public authority taking charge of projects, delivering projects across the entire PP process cycle, ensuring that everyone has a role to play and those roles are defined clearly and they can be part of a team. So first it's about you know, uh, ensuring that everyone on the team knows they are part of a team, but also their perception you know, you know, 
is that they are part of the team. Whether there's failure or there's success, they can identify with that failure of success. And so first is that a team, you know, a winning team is a team that performs. And for us to perform effectively as a team in the context of PPPs and in the context of public authority taking charge, every, everyone's perception has to be that we are all part of a team. Next slide, please. Now, in, in terms of uh, defining who is on your team, you know, um, for public authority being uh, the, the leader, leader in terms of the person responsible across the parties, whether it's private and public, the person responsible for the delivery of projects across the process cycle, the public authority holds the ace, that's what I would put it. The public authority is the leader, is the, is the one that would define failure or success. And so, who is on your team? Sometimes we have a, a situation where a public authority says, okay, and we have a project, we hire an advisor, and that advisor, please just send us your report, and we review the report and send it back to you and give you comments. However, how do you ensure that the advisor who does a report is part of your team to ensure that the, the, the comments or the outcome of that report is implemented? You know, for example, um, um, an advisor prepares a report and gives you a guide on what to do and how to deliver a particular project and is not part of that team to deliver that project. You know, so the, 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 the advisor doesn't see himself as part of your team. And so if the main transaction advisor doesn't see himself as part of your team, everyone on the transaction advisory team, whether it's legal or financial, will not see themselves as part of the team. So first question is who is on your team? And as a public authority, you must define that to influence perception because if you don't get the perception right early on to ensure that the transaction advisory team will see themselves as part of a team, preparing projects and giving objective feedback. Objective meaning, oh, this is not looking good. Um, we shouldn't go for this. So there shouldn't be a green light to go for the, to the next stage. You should know that that person is saying that from an objective position and part of a team member saying that, okay, we need to do something different or we should just shut this down here. Or let's go ahead, meaning if there's failure down the line, I will be part of that failure. So early on, influence that perception to ensure that everyone on the cycle is part of that team. Whether it's from the pre-contract stage or the post-contract stage, Interestingly, the post-contract is actually more, more, more difficult because you're now an operator and you want to see yourself as part of a team delivering services to the public. So first question is who is on your team? Define that clearly. Ensure that everyone that has a significant role to play is, see, has that perception of being part of your team to deliver a project. Next slide, please. Now, after delivering the project, you know, um, um, delivering um, um, the, per uh, the perception that I'm part of a team, what does performance look like? For instance, I'll give you a, clear, a clear example. Um, um, we had a discussion you know, as a, as a, on the advisory team, working with a public authority, we had a discussion on um, a proposed PPP. And for us, we were very, very clear that they shouldn't go forward with that project. After our feasibility study, we were clear that they shouldn't go for it. But on the political level, <laughs> there was a pressure, there was this heavy pressure that no, we must go for this project. And I can tell you clearly, you're going, you're in for failure. But you see, for the politician, cutting the tape and announcing a project is performance. That's where it ends. Everybody claps and we all go home. Down the line, which is the delivery of the asset itself and the service, is the actual value. Whereas we've cut a tape and everybody's happy and that's performance. So first, uh, secondly, sorry, is defining what performance looks like. What is performance? That way we all have a common understanding of what performance is. So early on as an advisor, I'm looking down the line in terms of delivering value. And I tell you, this project is not looking good. Um, so I'm looking at the end game, but you as a politician or you as a leader as on the, on the public authority side might think, oh, oh no, we want to sign a contract. We want um, you know, sign a contract with a private authority, a private party, and so let's just get on with the project and sign and we'll take pictures, we'll have you know, you know, some videos and we'll share that. Everybody's happy. However, I am not happy as an advisor because I'm not part of that you know, potential failure. But if I see myself as a team member 
and I can understand what performance is, then I know that I'm being objective and the public authority should ensure that performance across board, everyone understands what it means. Example is, um, is um, you know, the one I just shared earlier where um, you tell a public authority that, oh, this project doesn't look good. If the public authority is very, very committed to, um, you know, making sure that the project is successful, then they should listen to advisors because advisors are part of the team and they will definitely be objective and they will definitely share in the failure or success of the project. Next slide, please. Beyond, beyond, beyond um, performance, you know, having a common understanding of what performance is, is the fact that you need to understand, you know, when there are setbacks. I tell you from my experience, either as an advisor or working for the government some years ago, but also working as an operator, we've had setbacks. I tell you the truth, when the project starts, particularly at the construction stage, there they will be setbacks. Setbacks in terms of time, setbacks in terms of you know, deliveries not happening as scheduled, setbacks in terms of suppliers not delivering their role, and in terms of you know, uh, the, the, the equipment they're supposed to deliver. There are several aspects where setbacks can happen. I can give an example. I used to work for a, um, a water services company for, as an operator, and one of, the, you know, one of those days we had a major bust. A 600 mm pipe, you know, supplying over 15,000 customers, you know, just went up. You know, we had a big water fountain. Now the public authority came to site. The pressure on us to 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 fix the pipe was beyond what we could cope with. Our thinking as a private operator in the PPP was that look, support us. Let's go out to the public, announce. You know, get the public ready that we're sorry this happened. Within two days, we're going to fix this. Fix this. And we, we have some, um, you know, options for you. We're going to bring water to some communities. We'll bring some trucks to deliver water within the 24 hours. You know, let's have a way out. However, the public authority wasn't even on our side. They were putting so much pressure on us, telling us we can't support you now. You're the private guy. Get all your equipment. Get things done go to the public and announce, we pre would have preferred them making the announcement, you know, to ensure that the public has, you know, has the trust of the government. But they wanted us as private entities to make the announcement and do all that. But, so we, we didn't feel as though we're part of a team delivering value to the public. Um, so that's just a clear experience that, look, if you have a project to deliver, there will be setbacks. And let your team members know that, yes, it's okay to have setbacks. And we all can come out, you know, you know, successful, you know, from that setback, we will resolve it. Some PPPs have actually failed because of minor setbacks and there's no, you know, feeling of being part of a team. And so let everyone on the team know that, yes, there will be setbacks. Next slide, please. Now, in conclusion, you know, perception matters. Perception is very, very, very important because if I don't see myself as a team member, I will not be part of that team fully. I, I, I will not be very you know, excited about the team. Um, and my being objective, I will just give you my report as an advisor or do my role as an operator and just leave without looking at the value you know, delivering to the public. Um, then also we don't understand performance. What is performance? You know, what, what defines performance for everyone? So for us to have a winning team, particularly in the context of PPPs, one perception has to be that everyone is on the team. You're a team member who's sharing the success and failure. Two, we define what performance looks like for everyone and at every stage. Then three, we can become a winning team over a long period of time. Thank you. Thank you, Nia Nan. So that was great. Um, really great advice there on how to build um, the best winning team. So um, we're going to come to uh, Suchitra now for the first question on our focus topic. Um, and then we'll see what the panel has to say. Suchitra, first question, please. Yes, please. We have a question from Vinod in Dubai and UAE. PPP teams are usually formed of multi-skilled and sometimes multicultural groups. Respect, trust, and understanding, which is crucial to succeed in a project. Okay, panel. Um, uh, Nia Nansa, we might come back to you first for this one, and we'll go to Amandeep afterwards and then to Armin. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that's true. I mean, PDP is multi-skilled, multi-multicultural, and that's why you know, um, you know, 
when you are setting up your team, you're bringing people that are not your day-to-day -day colleagues at the office. You're bringing your advisors, different levels of consultants to be part of your team. And so to ensure that you have trust and understanding, transparency is one. Very, very important to be transparent early on. Let everyone know what you're doing. Share all the documentation, share all the plans. Everyone should have a common understanding and a clear you know, roadmap on what you're planning. Second is equity. When I say equity, I mean, let everyone know they have a stake. Let everyone know that what they are doing has value. Don't let the environmental or governance expert think, oh, um, your role is not very, very important. Let everyone know that their role is very, very significant, significant, but also very, very important to success. So when they all have that confidence and, and, and the trust that you will be transparent, you, there's equity, what, whatever role I'm playing on the team has value, then also there's benefit for everyone, meaning we can share in the success you know, of, of the project, uh, then everyone will be part of, um, of a successful team, you know, having a winning team to deliver a project. Thank you. Thank you, Nian. So, Armandeep, your thoughts on this one, please. Oh, yeah, Armin uh, first. That's, that's fine. Oh, yeah. So, Go ahead, Armandeep. Uh, yeah, so the question rightly said that, okay, how to ensure respect, trust, and understanding between the PPP teams, multicultural. Yes, it is the responsibility of each and every team member, but the onus comes on to the, the, who, the guy or the girl who's leading the team the team leader, attitude of the team leader, responsibility, first of all, you know, respect and trust, how the team, you know, having a trust, team leader, if he's a knowledgeable, giving everyone, every team member a space, keeping transparency, wherever someone is lacking, for example, ex team member is, you know, having some trouble, troubleshoot it, and hold it, so you, you, you have a respect and trust and obviously once the team leader and the other members do the same way so do you the each team member will understand okay this is a way of working so there's no hustle and bustle understanding again it's a knowledge sharing between the team leader between the team so understanding will be better if to succeed uh, the attitude is to succeed the project so a project succeeds means if someone has an issue so go together if some problem comes as Nian so uh, you know, discussed in the uh, earlier questions of so political, for example, you know, pressures. So as a team, we need to uh, tackle it. So the way that, you know, you come as a team and trust um, and make a better understanding and take the project to succeed, uh, to the success. Thank you so much. Now, Armin. Uh, I would just like to add uh, that uh, defining the roles of the individual always helps. So the individuals on the team, what roles they're playing sort of helps uh, to have clarity within the team. Uh, I noticed also meeting early, sort of like being on the ground level uh, of the project and having interaction in the early part of the development and meeting the team early on always helps to have a more dynamic team and uh, add to the importance of communication. So just simple tools uh, to use. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you. We've got so many um, great questions um, coming in. So we'll move on to the next one, please, Suchitra. Well, we have a question from Chukuri Ononagbu. What would you consider to be the winning team? Is it the collective parties involved in the PPP project or the different individual parties that make up the PPP? Okay, thank you. Uh, Maurice, we'll come to you for this one and then me and Anso. Okay, so I'm afraid it's both. Um, essentially, uh, it's important to have the right individuals. Each individual has got to make a contribution to the team in the way that I'm in just said, defining roles and so on. People have skills. They will also have a particular status within the team and they need to work together and the way that they work together collectively is what will build the overall success if people don't pull together in the right direction or in the same direction we're not actually going to be able to deliver what we should deliver i've worked on projects where we've had two large management consultancies with some of the best experts in the world 
that each management consultancy was trying to outdo the other management consultancy and at the same time demonstrate that the other management consultancy really shouldn't be on the job. And that created, as you might imagine, friction and tension on the team that actually resulted in delays in the project. Um, now, to be fair, one was a surveyor, a surveying type company, and another one was much more uh, accountancy based with background. Both had a right to be on the project. Both could make a sensible contribution to the project. But the behaviors that were happening in the background were suboptimal. So basically, I think what's important is how the individual parties work together to make that collective. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Nian so oh, sorry, Maurice. Thank you, Maurice. Um, Nian so did you have some uh, comments on this one? Yes. Yes. Um, so, so this speaks to the to the focus presentation, you know, because when you go into a project, you know, you're, you're going as part of a team. So if you're an advisory, part of the advisory team, you're part of a team. So for the advisory team, there's a level of, you know, winning. So for instance, you complete your feasibility study, you've won, you know, at that level. However, um, when, where it speaks to the focus, you know, presentation is that if you see yourself as the project team, not just the advisory team now, as the project team, then you're not just seeing your winning as delivering a, a good feasibility study. Your winning is also leading to a contract close, a financial close, but also actually delivering asset and service on the ground. So your winning is over a period of time and it's, 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 it's something you continuously win because you feel proud that my, the project I was part of is delivering service and delivering value. So on one end, as part of individual parties, you can start having a winning as a transactional advisory team, but as a project team, winning is the collective, is the entire team that has been part of that project from the public side, the private side, the advisory and you know, the non-governmental non organizations that are part of it, everyone is part of that winning. Thank you, Nian and so, um, so panel, we've got so many questions coming in that we're not going to be able to get to time wise today. So I just want to let the audience know we will be returning to the subject of PPPs um, in our show on the 4th of October. So anything that doesn't get answered today, we will pick up and cover in that show. OK, um, so Chicho, please, can we have what will be the last question for today's panel before we move into closing thoughts? We have a question from Gabriel Bobby. What skills should heads of PPP units and governments have, considering the mm. wide range of expertise required for the delivery of PPP projects, from preparation to contract management? So Mark, you had your hand up before um, we even read that question out, so we'll, we'll come <laughs> to you first on this one. I think they need a wide range of skills. Um, but also they need the confidence to be able to let others, you know, get on with their work and then challenge where um, I made the point earlier around people sort of looking to make things more complicated than they are. And I think that sort of played to Morris's point around one consultancy out doing another for complexity. So, you know, a uh, head of a PPP unit is that's confident to say, look, I don't understand this. You're making it more complicated than it needs to be. Can we boil this down into some of the basics useful? Um, and it's some of those softer skills we were mentioning just now, you know, the ability to see it as a collective, to pull through uh, the right sort of technical experts at the right time, um, and understanding that um, you don't get value for money from a PPP on the day that you sign the contract. That comes over 25 years. So, um, you know, please don't underestimate the contract management needed because the, you know, the benefits come for 25 years. Um, and I suppose finally, you know, just the ability to, again, uh, speak sort of truth, truth to power. So, you know, PPP unit lead, but also able to be honest, open, transparent, and when necessarily challenging with their seniors as well, because I've seen too many instances of um, the seniors sitting above the PPP unit not being told, you know, what's really going on whether that's senior civil servants, public servants or uh, politicians, you know, not really being told what's happening. Um, and obviously in the UK, we've got 700 PFIs done to date, some of which haven't gone as well as they might. And I'm going to say one of the reasons for that is perhaps there hasn't been 
as much honesty from the people sort of running them in some cases historically uh, to those at the top of the shop. Thank you, Mark. That's a uh, really great um, feedback. Uh, Nian Anso, did you have something you wanted to add to this one before we do the closing yes. remarks? Yes. yes. Um, so first is that, yes, I agree with Mark. Um, you need you need um, a wide range of skills as a head of PP units. But in Nigeria and you know, even in other African countries where we've worked, heads of PP units basically represent the government in a PP project. So they are basically the ones running the team on behalf of the government. And so they are responsible for delivery of projects from the preparation stage to contract management. And so they are part of a project delivery team. Now, what that means is you're going to have quite a number of consultants you're going to work with. So number one, you need consultant management skills. Because honestly, you can't be the expert on all the areas of PPPs. So what you need to do is managing consultants effectively to deliver value for the project. It means day-to-day -day understanding what PP process is, but also what are they supposed to deliver to you in terms of value. Then people management. There are several number of people that will come into the project that you need to understand their role, ensure you get the best from them being part of the project. Then stakeholder management. All those other soft skills beyond the technical skills of understanding PPPs, you need stakeholder management. More important is politicians and the user public. Politicians have to be managed very carefully because they have a, a very limited time, but also the public needs to understand the project in a way that they see the value for the general public and not just private sector coming to take money from the public. Thank you. Thank you so much, panel. That's the end of our questions for today. So if I could just come to everybody for a very brief closing thoughts on the show. We are almost out of time. So just something very quick from everybody. I will start with you, Armin. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, having me on this panel. Uh, I, uh, I would like to just give an added comments of what I think uh, may be important factors uh, that could uh, add uh, to our discussions. Uh, we noticed, for example, in Canada with a very high success of uh, P3s is that when you have a P3, when you have a public-private partnership, you expect it to be better and more efficient and things like innovation from the private sector and efficiency will always add to projects and uh, hopefully uh, develop these projects in the right direction. And uh, it was a very interesting uh, panel that I enjoyed being part of. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Mark, your final thoughts for the today? So firstly, again, thanks for the opportunity to be part of the panel. It's been a very rich discussion. Um, I'm going to do the pitch in terms of, you know, get your project teams through the CP3P and also the better business case training because it will upskill, it will address that sort of asymmetry between the private sector and the public sector. But it also, I think, helps with some of the softer skills we've talked about in terms of how do you build the team? Well, you know, day and a half, two days, three days, sort of upskilling is, is useful. I'm also going to make the pitch in terms of, you know, do have a look and see what's uh, going on in the UK, because as I say, we are, I guess, probably at the other end of a, a pipeline. We've done 700 sort of PFIs uh, to date, um, and some of them are beginning to expire, you know. So what's the experience once you've done all of the, the setup, mm. the amendments, the uh, operational efficiencies, and you're now into sort of expiry and the follow on arrangements. So there's some things from the UK that are worth looking at. Lovely. Thanks, Mark. Um, Maurice, quickly from you, please. Um, so again, thank you very much. And again, uh, the pitch. So please don't just do CP3P yourself, but uh, your colleagues should do it. And what skills should a head of a PPP unit have? Well, obviously project management, but at the end of the day, it will be no harm if they do the foundation level CP3P, because that gives them all they need to know to run a unit. Um, so I recommend that. And just to support Mark yet again, actually, there's a fantastic National Audit Office report that was produced in about October of last year in the UK, which is, in fact, all about what Mark is talking about, which is the end of PPP contracts and handing back the assets to governments and so on. And I recommend that as a good read. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Maurice. And Armandy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for... Uh, you know, inviting me to this show, it's really been wonderful. Uh, so 
from our discussions today, like the last question, for example, what PPP unit should be doing? So, right, uh, apart from you know soft skills and management of consultants and the team, just to manage the particular pressure and select the right project, identify, screen the right project that will because PPP unit success is to if the projects get succeeded. If they don't get succeeded, so they don't get anything. So right. Project selection is very important. Screen it. There are where there is tools. Do the public invest through the public investment management, and then you are there. So if project is right, you have a right team in place. You will get the success. Thank you. Thank you, Armandeep. And finally, Nian Anso, um, thank you for being our focused uh, topic speaker today. Any closing thoughts for you? Yeah, thank you very much. It was a very interesting session, uh, and thank you everyone for sending in very, very good questions. We look forward to future events and we hope that we can have very, very rich and resourceful discussion like this next time. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panel. You've been excellent um, and uh, no doubt we will see you again on another Level Up show. Uh, so next show is coming up uh, Monday the 20th. We have two shows. Uh, you can join us again at 7 a.m. Uh, British summertime, 11.30 in India or 4 p.m. in Australia as we discuss leveling up your business relationships, what makes for good relationships and those things that we should all avoid. Our focus topic is all about the role of the business relationship manager, what it is and how do I become one. Uh, later in the day at uh, 1 p.m. British summer time, um, at 2 p.m. in Europe and 8 a.m. over in the US, we'll be discussing uh, projects and change management with a particular interest in online resources from templates to methods and from projects to portfolios. Subscribe to the show and we'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you can join in. As I mentioned earlier, we will be running another session on public-private partnerships on the 4th of October. So um, watch the events page uh, to find out more about how you can join us for that. Thanks everybody and see you on the next show.